How's everybody doing? Good, hey, thank you. How nice are you? Nice to see you, John. All right, good to see you guys too. Everybody holding up okay with the drought? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, right now the drought is normal. Right. <laughs> but uh, it wasn't good that the drought extended so far back into the recent past, and hopefully it won't extend for too many more months, but we'll see. I agreed. We caught a break down here. We're uh, just classified as drier than normal. So it's, uh, I really feel for my friends up north. So yeah, I was very surprised when I went out to Rancho Hamul a few weeks ago at the higher elevations there. There was really great grass growth. I was very surprised. I expected to see, see it as bad as it was down on the, down on the flats, but some, some way the timing must have been just right to get things going. Yeah, it's, uh, I'll, I'll go into detail with that more with, with you, but it's, you know, the grazing and then resting and then, you know, it does a big, it's a big deal. It does grow more grass, but then you do have more fire issues, you know, that you got to deal with, but we do grow more pounds per acre by, uh, by grazing and then resting and moving on to the next paddock. So, um, it's taken me seven years to kind of grasp it and get get it in line. It's not a real quick thing to do, but NRCS started us with this about seven years ago. So, and it's working for us. So it's a good thing. Well, welcome to all of our, uh, our attendees today. It's nice to see people rolling in. Uh, we're gonna get started around uh, five past the hour, just to make sure that uh, that everybody has a chance to, to, to log in. But you have free access to our presenters in those moments, so feel free to say hello. Here's Richie Phillips. Hey, Richie. <laughs> How you guys doing? Good, Rich. How are you? You staying cool? I can't hear him. Can't hear you, Richie. I'm tuning in from the office here, so you all may hear some calls about our defensible space program. We're mostly a fire-focused RCD, so you'll uh, you'll get some information on that at the end of the at the end of the call. <laughs> See someone's tuning in from their iPhone. Uh, who might that be? Nice, nice put a name to the face. And you are currently muted, so you can go ahead and take it off. Just introduce okay. yourself. Okay. Yeah, I'm unmuted. Is this uh, Joel? Yeah, my name is Joel. I'm Stan Smith, Joel. Good to meet you in person. So good to meet you. Nice chatting with you the <laughs> other day. Yeah, it was good chatting with you. Where'd you get those cows? Is that a natural background or? Those are awesome. I stole them from John Austell. He just oh, had them out there roaming in the field. Wow, Rancho Hamul, huh? Yep. Yeah, he's got some fine Angus down there. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Dan. Good to see you. Hey, John, how you doing? I'm doing good. I like your ride behind you there. Uh, that, is that your new wheels? Oh, my tank, huh? Yeah. I think that was the last Zoom meeting I was on. <laughs> it, carried, it carried over. <laughs> it's, That's it's awesome. A good agricultural device too. It'll 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 uh, clear paths and uh, and uh, and take care of uh, brush. 
Yeah, and uh, maybe help uh, get rid of the ground squirrels, huh? Right. <laughs> I'll see if I can. Uh, I'll see if I can switch that to a more uh, egg, uh, better egg background. <laughs> so only my fourth Zoom meeting. <laughs> okay. Well, at least I'm on the on the Zoom. It's nice to have you, Stan. Thanks for coming. Yeah, John. Good deal. There is somebody calling in from their cell phone too. I got a 619 number. Uh, do you have a minute to introduce yourself? I think you might be able to do that by pressing star six. All right, well, just a couple more minutes here. We got people rolling in still, uh, but we'll get started at five past the hour. All right, well, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Looks like we got a great group, uh, right for a good discussion. Um, my name is Joel Kramer. I'm the new Regional Agricultural Specialist at the Resource Conservation District of Greater San Diego County. And uh, I've been working with John Ostell the last few months following the good work of the, the others who had founded this program, including Chandra Richards, who's on this call. So hello, Chandra. Um, and we are funded by the Department of Food and Agriculture to, uh, to conduct a prescribed grazing project and monitor the effects on carbon sequestration and uh, stubble height at uh, Rancho Hamul, um, which is a really exciting project. You're gonna hear a lot more about it, uh, but I do wanna take a minute to introduce our other presenters today who have taken their time and their busy schedules to be here. Uh, Dr. James Bartolome is from UC Berkeley. He's part of the Berkeley Mafia, as they call it. He's a professor of rangeland ecology and is going to be focusing his discussion on uh, the effects on vegetation uh, of rangelands from grazing. Um, we also have Matthew Shapiro, who is a livestock and range advisor at UC ANR. Um, and he's been doing some interesting research about how uh, grazing and fire interrelate and, and how we can take it best advantage of that. And Madeline Milner is here. She is a rangeland management specialist at NRCS, and she'll be giving you some great information about uh, ranchers who have implemented these practices over longer periods of time and some opportunities you might have to take advantage of those grant opportunities as well. Um, and of course, uh, John Ostell uh, of 4J uh, Horse and Livestock. John's gonna be sharing uh, some updates from Rancho Hamul in a few minutes. Um, but before we get too deep into it, I did wanna share a video with you uh, that, that John has, uh, has shown me that I think really captures what we're going for here, which is um, that conservation objectives 
and uh, rangeland or, or grazing objectives for to um, improve ranching can actually uh, support one another. And uh, I, I'd like to share a quick video of a form of wildlife fencing um, that's been used in Wyoming that that uh, can actually support deer populations as they migrate through. So um, you should be able to see my screen. And it's optimized, it's, uh, you should be able to hear the audio as well as it starts to play. <laughs> so you can see here as the deer, the mature ones jumping over this fencing and the young deer able to go right underneath it. Um, and so they're able to conduct these prescribed grazing practices where cattle can graze within these pastures without actually interfering with wildlife migrations. So there's a little taste of, of one aspect of this work. Um, I do want to hand pass the baton over to our presenters momentarily, um, but before we get too far ahead, I want to just set some ground rules about um, how, uh, how we'd like to run the presentation today. Firstly, there's a lot of people on the call, so if you could take your video off while you're not speaking, I'd appreciate that. Um, however, if you have a question to ask, um, or uh, are speaking at some point, please bring it back on. It'd be great to see your face at that point. Also, I've muted everyone to, to start out with. Um, so if you'd like to speak, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself, um, or you can drop your question into the chat. Um, that's actually the preferred method. If you can mention in the chat that you'd like to speak, then I can find a window for you to jump in. Um, our open a uh, question and answer period will happen after all our presenters have introduced their topics. So that'll be in about half an hour and we'll get a lineup going for, for everyone's questions um, to be addressed. Um, so again, really glad to have everybody here today. And uh, John, um, I'm gonna, I'll be ready to share the screen with your slides whenever you're ready. I'll pass it off to you. Okay, I guess uh, what we uh, <clears throat> pretty much I wanted to do was just share what we're doing here at Rancho Hamul um, Ecological Reserve. It, it has a long history of grazing, uh, ranching uh, for over 200 years. It used to be a Spanish land grant, so cattle, sheep. It's it's a it's been a, a pretty heavy ag use property uh, that has now been. Uh, 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 that is now owned by the CDFW and is designated as a wildlife uh, or as a reserve. So um, uh, the things that we do on a reserve are, are much more uh, constrained, I guess, or much more monitored as far as different things that we're, that we're doing. So we graze for different purposes on the property. Uh, our property, uh, the information I'm gonna share with you today is, is some of the some of the stuff is something that you might uh, want to use on your own uh, ranch uh, or uh, if you're a land manager or consultant, you might want to implement in another, in another uh, um, uh, grazing plan or something like that. Everything I'm, I'm just showing you what works for us on this particular property. Every property is different. So you're going to be able to, you know, you, you need to be a little bit of creative. And basically we're going to talk about what to look for as far as dealing with wildfire, um, um, uh, fire fuel reduction. Uh, now we had two wildfires in 2003 and 2007, so the ranch is burnt twice. Uh, we uh, got a grant uh, through the EQIP program through NRCS seven years ago to help put the ranch back together through solar systems and, uh, and wildlife fencing structures that were not along a major highway, but it was internal, which allowed the wildlife to flow. One of the pictures that I didn't see in that video that Joel showed at the beginning was we had, a, there was a big buck that had a huge rack 
and uh, he just jumped over that fence without any trouble. So the wildlife fencing for us is working on our property. Um, the top wire is smooth, the bottom wire is smooth, the bottom wire is 18 inches from the ground. You have a two point barb wire in the middle, six inches apart. And then on the top wire, the top wire is smooth and is 12 inches from the, uh, from the third wire from the ground. So um, it's, it's worked well um, and uh, it's allowed the wildlife to flow through the property. Um, I guess, Joel, uh, what we wanna do is let's start with the first picture. Uh, in 2017, our first slide um, is dealing with uh, the gate fire that happened in 2017. And in 2017, um, the way I do our grazing uh, that was started through NRCS through prescribed grazing uh, was basically we graze a certain paddock for or a certain area for a certain number of days, the certain number of AUM, then we pull them off and we let it rest. And it rains during the grain se during the rainy season or wet weather or growing season, and we allow uh, new growth to happen. As you can see on the bob wire or on the fence down below at the bottom of the picture, we had a good rain year. We had eight, I think, 16 inches of rain, and I've got feed that's almost to the top of the wire uh, on this particular on our property, and this is one of our fields that we're grazing. Across, you can see the the mountain there. That is owned by BLM. Uh, it has not been grazed for years. It's been sitting fallow. Um, as you can tell, even like from Matt's, uh, I really enjoyed Matt's and both, well, all of the presentations, but Matt really kind of uh, hit it on the head on the, the fire fuel load and the height of the flame. Well, you can see here in this picture on the top of the uh, mountain, those flames were quite a quite a ways away taking this photo. They, they're about 10 to 15 feet tall. Uh, and they were coming, the wind was a Santa Ana wind. It was blowing southwest, which means it was being pushed by the wind right now down towards this highway. You can see the fire truck here along the road. So the flames were huge and everything and anything in this way was going at a rapid pace. Joel, let's take a look at the uh, next slide. Now what happened here is about 20 minutes later, we had a major wind shift uh, and blowing from Southwest, which is blowing from, uh, you know, blowing towards the ocean in my particular location, the wind shifted and started blowing Northeast. And that was a major blessing for us and a major break. So the fire started blowing back against itself and it's the flames reduced down to about eight inches. And then as you can see there along the road, the fire, the, they just let it burn down to the highway and, and Cal Fire just ran up and down the highway and just uh, put it out with their hoses right on the highway. So none of it really hit our, this particular field. It did hit a, one of our fields that we currently graze down further. It did cross the road. It's just a little two lane road um, so it was not, you know, a little two lane road for a fire break was not, not a whole lot with the wind that was behind it and the fire fuel load that was behind it as well. So after this fire in 2017, uh, the on-site reserve manager, Tracy Nelson for the CDFW and I got together and we got, we said, we got to do something. We got to come up with some kind of plan. Uh, scared us pretty good, uh, and uh, we caught a break, but let's take it and uh, take it a step further, and let's see what we can do to uh, to create something uh, that would allow us to uh, be proactive uh, against something like this. Um, so uh, I went across the street to Cal Fire. There's a major uh, station right across from the ranch, uh, or offset from the ranch, but a uh, call file there, and they basically indicated to us to go ahead, start uh, grazing or creating a defensible space along the highway, and then move to the middle of the ranch. So, and I'm, I'm going to kind of show that to you. And basically, all I'm talking about is really dealing with creating a large defensible space, uh, uh, like we do around our houses, our structures, or barns on ranches. Uh, 
to protect structures. Well, we're kind of doing the same thing for this particular property. Of course, large landscapes, uh, you know, we, we are using cattle, large landscapes, they remove 25 to 30 pounds of dry matter or fire fuel, uh, you know, a day. Uh, so uh, that is to our benefit on larger lambs, larger landscapes. If you have a smaller landscape, sheep, goats, uh, whatever the goal is for that property, uh, whether it's conserved or public lands or private use, uh, is you know you can use the appropriate livestock to to do your grazing. Um, so when I do the let's go to the next one. Here we go. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is the RCD grant. Uh, the Healthy Soils Grant, it added $1,000 of additional acreage to our existing permit. <clears throat> and we were dealing with areas uh, that we're trying to uh, uh, actually that haven't been grazed before. Uh, we have test sites set up that are uh, containment areas to keep livestock out because we're doing a, a, a healthy soils demonstration uh, to store carbon. See where our uh, what on our range ground with large paddocks like this, uh, how much carbon are we storing in the ground? Uh, and this is our this is our project with uh, through CDF and our local RCD. And uh, so this is kind of our our these are our maps and these are the fields that we're some of the fields that we're working in one two three four uh, four five and six. Uh, those are the ones that we're using it currently. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. <clears throat> okay, and that's, this is another slide basically just kind of going on more of the same. Uh, it's just showing a topo map. Basically, uh, the, the one here in the center is our canyon, uh, canyon uh, pond. Uh, these happen to, all these fields happen to be in our same area for wildfire uh, fuel reduction. So we have Bowtie Lakes Road, Coming down here, um, that's along the base. We have an upward slope going here off of the road. Uh, same with field one up here on the top and field two. Those are all fields that have uh, are along Highway 94 where we've had almost a fire every year from a car going through a fence, a uh, car pulling off to the side with the bad catalytic converter and it just, you know, starting a fire right there and right then. So um, let's take a look at our, some of our target areas uh, that we're looking at to reduce uh, our fire fuel load. <clears throat> on the, the picture above on the left is steel deal, dealing with uh, the Canyon Pond Field. It's a close up. You can see Old Tai Lakes Road, which is a two lane road going down through there. And uh, that's where the, uh, um, actually part of the, the gate fire did cross and started to head up towards the canyon uh, pond field that we have here. Uh, and uh, Cal Fire put it out with the helicopters and, and the bucket drops of water. So it didn't actually make it up the canyon, but it was heading that direction. Uh, the fire fuel load was super heavy. Uh, all these paddocks have never been grazed before. They haven't been grazed since 1998 but they have burnt in the uh, 03 and 07 fires. So um, basically that was one of our targeted areas. Down on the bottom picture down below here, <clears throat> there's uh, where the cursor is right now. Uh, that's the Pio Pico campground. Um, and if we have a wind that's blowing, uh, you know, northwest, uh, then I've got the fire fuel load that we've got a worry about in the in the fields in these black lines. Those are the other paddocks that were that were also grazing for fire fire fuel load reduction. Um, so this is part of our uh, our plan to actually be proactive regarding uh, regarding uh, wildfires. Now I can't be in every field at every time. Uh, it just takes time to go ahead and get to these fields. Uh, so basically what we do, let's go to the next picture. Um, okay, this is our last picture. This is basically, um, we, yeah, I might have you go back uh, again, Joel, but um, this is our, this is an after picture. The, Joel, the picture that you saw with Joel in the background, that was before we just put the cattle in. We just put them in that day. 
these are the million dollar homes that you're seeing above here where we're grazing cattle. The homes, of course, are on the upward slope um, and the cattle are removing, you know, uh, quite a bit of fire fuel through grazing at this point. Um, but let me go back, Joel, to the first, the colored picture of the tope, the maps, if you are able to. Right there. <clears throat> so as you can see, uh, one, uh, the green field, that was the last picture that we looked at right there along the, uh, the green and the pink field there is Highway 94. It comes all the way down to where the blue field is and then it turns down, that's Otai Lakes Road. So what we're trying to do in areas, I've also got fields across from one and across from two. Those are areas that we currently graze as well. So what we're doing here, this is actually a better visual of creating a defensible space from the, uh, from the highway. So CAL FIRE basically said, create a defensible space along the areas that you're grazing and then move to the center of the ranch uh, after you've hit those defensible spaces. That's pretty much what we're, what we're doing right now. Uh, lo local NRCS, uh, Raul, uh, Raul Alvarado, Axel Sanchez, uh, Madeline, basically have all had some kind of input into what we're doing out here. Uh, they're currently funding our water sources and uh, for uh, these paddocks to help us with this prescribed grazing, just like Mike Williams uh, 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 said in, his, in uh, Madeline's, uh, in Madeline's um, video. I'm trying to think if I forgot anything. Uh, so basically when we're resting, we're grazing, we're uh, resting the paddock, we're growing, uh, growing more pounds per acre at this point in time so that we don't have to basically buy hay. That's the, that's the problem. Oh, sorry about that, my dogs. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so anyway, they, uh, uh, that's what we're doing. So basically we are reducing our fire fuel uh, at the same time as we're grazing uh, by, uh, by our particular plan. I think that's all I've got, unless I forgot something. But I think the the real gist of the thing of what we're doing is dealing with uh, the ability to do something. I think what's important is is we can't we can't really do nothing anymore. Whether it's you know you're on a conserved land, a state, city, whatever entity you are, private, any of that that needs to be. We need to address our situation with wildfire. So I'm giving you an example of what we do on our particular property. Uh, this is something that is um, that's working for us at this point in time. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was that along fields yeah. one, one and two, uh, and some of the places along the highway, if I can't get there right away, the state of California and myself kind of uh, get together and we decide, okay, let's mow, just mow down a couple of strips uh, from the highway into the pasture until I can get there with the cattle. So we're leveraging our time to, uh, you know, as far as a response time, if something does start along the highway, then we're dealing with, uh, you know, a response time that Cal Fire can get out there and hopefully it, it doesn't turn into something they can't control um, uh, from a standpoint of, something that's uh, just picking up speed at, at a real high pace. So we're doing stuff to leverage ourselves to, to reduce it. Um, and people might say, well, doesn't that take time and energy? Yes, it does. Um, it does take time to do, which means it does cost some money. It doesn't cost to me, it doesn't cost as much to do that. Those types of proactive work compared to losing, uh, you know, thousands of pounds of feed uh, and where I have to really uh, uh, scramble to find uh, either another place to put my cattle or I have to buy hay or uh, something else. So from that standpoint, it's worth it to me personally. Um, the pounds per acre, I saw a question pop up, the pounds per acre, some of these I guess we can answer later, but each paddock is, has a different, a different uh, goal with not just wildfire, but I have wildlife, I have a uh, different type of rangeland that we have to take a look at 
so in my particular you know, circumstance, I've got uh, burrowing owls that we graze for. I've got uh, raptors that we graze for, golden eagles, um, red-tailed hawks, uh, uh, you know, the other and other uh, you know, tricolored blackbirds are out there uh, that hang with the cattle. Lots of different species. So we try to do as much as we can as far as reducing the pounds, you know, pounds per acre of a fire fuel load so that at least, you know, cow fire can get out there and deal with it. And it's not as intense. The fire's not as intense. The, uh, and they have the ability to get out there in time to go ahead and get it, get it uh, under control. So I'm hoping that makes sense. Um, I guess we can ask questions later, uh, Joel. I, I, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, let's do that. We'll okay. have we'll have a good chunk of time later, but uh, hopefully that orients everybody to where we're trying to put these principles into practice in Hamul. Um, and uh, thanks everybody for putting your questions in. We'll make sure to um, to get, address those in the next 15, 20 minutes. Uh, but first, we're gonna hear from uh, the other presenters. Most of you have probably already seen their videos uh, that were posted on our... Uh, most of you have probably already seen the videos from uh, James, Matthew, and Madeline that were posted on our YouTube page. They're still up there and available for you. Um, but uh, each of the presenters is going to go through for a few minutes now and kind of give a brief summary of what that was about. Uh, to make sure that if you have any other questions um, that you are oriented to uh, what what the subject was. So James, do you mind starting out uh, with the with your summary of what your video was about? Fine. <clears throat> thank you, Joel, and uh, thank you, John, for your your introduction. That really uh, gave us a good picture on what what you're faced with uh, in terms of the multitude of uh, objectives for grazing grazing management. I'm going to be very brief here. Um, you were able to look at look at the video. I hope there will be questions from that. And in the case of the video, there were a few technical glitches. Um, when I tried to put this together, I had a longer video and had to cut it down to cut it down to size. So I apologize for a couple of those. And I'm not going to go over a complete summary of the video. I just want to hit on a couple of a couple of points. So one point is that, and I'm going to use a broader perspective than one. You just heard from, from John, he's gave us a good introduction to what needs to be applied on the ground. But the larger perspective I wanna briefly bring up, and that is that on range and rangelands in San Diego County, there, we're faced with quite a diversity of, of goals and objectives and targets for, um, for grazing, grazing management. And so my lab has got a, project with funded by San Diego uh, area, area governments, which is a grazing, a San Diego grazing monitoring project. And the project is designed to develop methods for evaluating grazing use on, um, and, the, and the possible benefits of grazing on lands in San Diego. And one of the, the properties that we're, going to be looking at is, is Rancho Hamul and also Jason Hollenbeck, Hollenbeck Canyon. The approach that's used is one that is called, and this is described in the, in the talk, is ecological site descriptions. These are a way of organizing information about, about rangelands, and they contain state and transition models which allow us to predict what the effects of different management practices are. This has been very effectively used and sponsored by NRCS. It's, um, it's something that's active uh, um, in the United States going on. Uh, there's, there's several tens of thousands of ecological site descriptions that are out there. And they're very good for guiding grazing management activities. And uh, you'll hear uh, from, NR from the NRCS, uh, from Madeline, about some of the ways that's used. And they work very well for grazing management. But one of the issues that comes up is when there are alternative goals and goals that would include things like carbon sequestration, um, biodiversity, fire and fuels management, and also some highly specialized grazing systems, ecological site descriptions as they exist now 
tend to be overly broad and covering broad, broad areas. So one of the things that we're going to be working on in San Diego County is looking at how we can make ecological site descriptions that are more tailored to the issues related to specific problems in San Diego County. So that's the main purpose of it. And that's something that I've described in the, in the talk. So in this case, that's not changing the existing ecological site descriptions. It's adapting them so that they have better information that's geared towards specific, specific practices. So that's one of the things that, that we're working on and we can, um, this, I hope that'll be, that'll something will come up in discussion. The other thing I wanted to mention is that there are plenty of sources of, of good information out there. The NRCS is of course, a really good source of information on grazing and you'll, you'll hear how to access that, so that those sources shortly. There also are other ways to get information and one that hasn't been brought up is that California does have a program which is the Certified Rangeland Manager Program, which is a way of certifying professionals that have experience in California working with grazing related issues. And that's something that can also be a source of, of information in filling in the ecological site descriptions and filling in the information that is needed to make good decisions about, about management, plan, management and, and planning. I think that's all I'm gonna say for now. Um, hopefully there'll be some more questions later. Okay, well, that's great. Thank you very much, James. Um, uh, Matthew, would you mind going next? And I'm happy to share my screen to show that image whenever you need it. Oh, sure, you can share it now. Thank you, Joel. Yeah, so hello, everyone. It's nice to uh, be able to be as in person as we can these days. It was funny recording this in the absence, of, total absence of a crowd, but I hope it came across well. I'm really looking forward to the discussion in the next hour or so. Um, for those who maybe didn't have a chance yet to see the video, uh, you saw from the flyer that Joel put out, but my talk was uh, essentially uh, summarizing some studies that we're doing to look at the effectiveness of grazing specifically to reduce fire risk. And for the purposes of my talk, I highlighted two projects that I'm uh, affiliated with uh, that's, that are ongoing both in the state currently. Uh, the first is what I called sort of a desktop exercise. Um, and it was uh, spearheaded by Davy Rao and Felix Ratcliffe who's with us today and Sheila Berry. And um, it was uh, uh, an exercise that was maybe simple in concept, but difficult to execute in terms of just figuring out how many cattle exist in our state and where they exist and how many you know, pounds of biomass they're harvesting on any given year. Um, sort of had to triangulate through a number of different records to be able to find really basic information like that. And then, you, in, and then sort of extrapolating some basic formulas, we were able to discern you know, how many pounds of fine fuels were being removed by these livestock on an annual basis in the context of trying to say something interesting about how that might be affecting fire uh, fire, you know, the existence of fire, fire prevalence, and then fire behavior on a sort of regional scale. Um, in, in, as part of that project, uh, we brought on some fire modelers out of UCSB who use sort of the best available fire behavior modeling to then make some um, discernments about sort of what, what the implications for that grazing impact might be for fire behavior across the state. The second project that I uh, described or summarized in my talk uh, is maybe uh, summarized best in this image. Joel, I, well, I guess the, uh, it's not too unflattering a photograph of me there. Um, Mid-speech, mid, mid but um, that project is what I'm, you know, I described sort of being more on the ground, experimental in nature, and it's we're doing both the statewide effort and then uh, uh, one that's centered in Santa Barbara County. Here are some images from Santa Barbara County, but one of the big gaps in the literature in California is that we don't have, you know, quantitative uh, sort of data-driven 
uh, answers about how grazing impacts fire behavior and how different levels of biomass um, can impact really basic metrics like flame length and rate of spread. And so across the state and then here again in Santa Barbara County, we're doing these, uh, we're experimentally manipulating the biomass to mimic grazing and then burning across these landscapes and conditions that are as close to wildfire as we can get with prescribed fire. And um, with some really interesting results and you know, the, the, the numbers aren't quite ready to share publicly, but you know, the, in, many, in many of these instances, the images are pretty powerful themselves. And here you get a sense of, sort of the flame. These are, so these are images on the screen here of flame length. This is how we were measuring flame length against those T posts. And you can see the different grazing or sort of you know, um, mimicked grazing treatments here. And um, yeah, I'm hoping, you know, ultimately I describe at the end there that uh, one of the ultimate goals of this, this work in particular is to assist, I think all of us rang rangeland managers in California have some, have some quantitatively based metrics and, and targets for how grazing can positively impact or I guess diminish fire behavior and make some of our ranches and landscapes a little more resilient to fire. Um, because right now, in a sense, you know, we, we know intuitively that grazing reduces uh, fire behavior, but um, having some harder numbers to that, I think, will really help us across the state as we begin to, to couple and understand how these management activities can impact wildfire. So with that, I'll maybe pass the baton. Hi, are you ready for me to start, Joel? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Madeline Milner. Uh, you can call me Maddie if we get to chatting after this. But um, unfortunately, I don't have any pictures or anything like that today. I'm just going to be speaking to you and summarizing um, a little bit of what I showed in my YouTube video. I don't do uh, research or like uh, Matthew and uh, Dr. Bartholomew do. So a lot of my video is just sort of like one shot pictures from clients that I work with. And, and what I did was showed some photos of sites that I've worked on in Southern California that just displayed some of the most common concerns that um, ranchers or farmers would come to me with throughout Southern California. And then I sort of crosswalked it over to you know, here's a photo, here are the resource concerns that we identify, here are the goals and objectives that that landowner brought to us when we had the first meeting, and then here is the, the types of practices that we kind of like identified to mitigate some of those resource concerns. And if you couldn't um, take the time to watch my video, I'll take just a moment here to remind you about um, what the Natural Resource Conservation Service is. So we were started um, around the time of the Dust Bowl, actually, when the then government recognized that natural resources and agriculture had to be protected on um, private farming land, you know, in, in addition to, you know, government owned uh, public lands. So what we do is we offer certified technical assistance on both natural resource management and agricultural production for private farmers and ranchers to help them meet uh, resource concerns on their properties. And I'll take one second to just do a tiny correction um, from John, if he doesn't mind, because NRCS funding that we use uh, for our customers comes from the Farm Bill. So it's there to protect food security and natural resources, um, but it does not technically operate uh, like a grant, like many of you might be familiar with. Um, officially, our language for it is that is a, uh, if you choose to apply for financial assistance to do a conservation plan with us. We call it a conservation contract. And I point that out only to say, from my experience with grants, which I am not the most, um, the, the work of proposing the plan and writing everything up, uh, I believe is typically done by the person who applies for the grant. And that is not the case if you work with the Natural Resource Conservation Service. We do all of that legwork. Um, we do the project design, we handle the environmental review, we design the engineering specs, um, we even handle any sort of like cultural resources review that might be necessary. Um, and then the person who owns the property is the one who ultimately um, does the work. 
uh, do the work, excuse me, is the one who puts the work on the ground with our assistance. Um, we have multidisciplinary staff. We have specialists um, for range like myself, um, agronomy, forestry, wildlife biology, civil and agricultural engineers, and an entire soil science staff. Um, and to help develop conservation plans. And we go all the way through, you know, from selecting practices with the client to actually designing the project and how it gets implemented on the ground. And all of that is to say that everything that we put on the ground um, is at the uh, choice of the landowner. Unlike other sort of natural resource government agencies that you might've had experience with, such as the Forest Service or the Bureau of Land Management, NRCS does not own or manage any land. We only work with private agricultural producers or forest landowners. And our, so our uh, funding from the Farm Bill is dedicated to, to them for those purposes. So everything is completely voluntary. Um, and I mentioned this in my presentation that you can actually work with NRCS at any time and only receive technical assistance and get our advice and our input on how you can better meet the goals on your property, whether that is to you know, increase grass production or reduce fuel load or optimize your wildlife habitat. And you can go through that entire uh, process with us for to outline recommendations and build what we always call a conservation plan. And then you can choose to take the, those recommendations and apply for financial assistance, or you can do it entirely on your own, or you can take it to a CPRM and, you know, sort of modify it how, you know, you want it to fit your property. And all that is to say that the at the end of the day, the decision maker is the person who is in control of the land. And NRCS and our staff exists to both protect natural resources and protect, you know, the viability of your agricultural um, operation. And I'll take just one more minute to talk about um, a partnership that I've had through the NRCS Lancaster office with Mike Williams, who is the president and I believe the founder of the Los Angeles um, County Cattlemen's Association chapter. Like John, he um, applied for a CDFA grant for prescribed grazing on his ranch in Los Angeles County. And since I came to my the office in Lancaster, I came in 2016 and around 2017, he came into the office and wanted to get some input and advice on you know, how the, the ranch was looking and what his production was like. And so we started doing some sort of like very simple vegetation monitoring out there. And when he ultimately applied for his grant, he came for us, he came to us to get advice on putting together the grazing management plan, um, which we worked with over a course of a couple of months so that we could cut, clip and catch some more data and get everything um, outlined. And then we were actually able to find someone internal from NRCS um, who was a CPRM who could review it for us. And it's been a really great partnership. If you're able to look at the, the video, you'll see sort of a before and after photo and how in only about two years between him applying some of the these range management practice, he was able to increase his um, residual dry matter in a very sensitive part of the property. And that little, it, it doesn't look like a lot because, you know, we're in Southern California, LA County, and you're not going to see a lot of rolling green grassy hills. But that layer of um, growth and protection that he's managed to get on his soil is going to be so important going into a year like this, where we're re really not getting much vegetation production at all. But because of his prior management, he's protecting his soil, you know, going through the rest of the summer and, and when we get our moisture and growth again so that he can better sequester carbon. He has a little bit more reserve feed on the ground so he can, doesn't have to buy quite so much feed to get him through the rest of the summer. And his soil is just generally better protected. And um, with that, I am excited to get talking and get into the Q&A section. So thank you so much. All right. Well, thanks to all of our presenters. That was really nice to get your summaries. And I, I hope uh, everybody has an understanding of people's different expertise and, and some of the questions you might ask. Um, some of the, we, we did receive a couple questions before uh, the event. And I'm going to paraphrase one here from Dr. Larry Ford. Um, but uh, Dr. Ford was essentially asking um, if, if there, there isn't information readily available to a rancher or, or an uh, rangeland agency about their site, um, then how best can they um, uh, how best can they conduct monitoring in order to, to guide adaptive management? So um, Bart Dr. Bartolome, I think that question was 
was for you. Okay, well, that's a, a typical question from Dr. Ford. It's very well thought out and has some difficulties in being answered, but I'll try. Um, so my reaction to that are, well, first, um, you can, the NRCS is a good source of, of information. Uh, the other source of information is UC Cooperative Extension. And so local Cooperative Extension people are available to give advice. Uh, UC Extension also has numerous publications that deal with, um, with grazing, man grazing management and, and issues related to grazing. The other place to get advice is that in California, the, there's a, a program called, um, well, it's professional certification, which certifies registered professional foresters and licensed range managers. And so there's a list of range managers that are available. There have been a total of, I think it's 117 people that were certified and licensed as range managers over the past past few decades, but that's a, a good source of information. Many of these people are, are consultants and, and work in this work in this area. There also are the agencies where um, other agencies, well, NRCS is one, but Forest Service has range managers working for them and there are other other places where you can get that information. But the I think the best way to get information is to look at the uh, California Pacific section of the Society for Range Management, look at the information that's there and that gives, gives contact information for people. Of course, there's also, um, you know, for people that are interested working on ranching activities, probably the best source of information is colleagues and peers within the profession. Um, certainly um, John in his talk showed us that he's got a good grasp on the kinds of things that go on and grazing management. So that's my, I guess that's my short version of the answer for your question. Thank you, James. Um, Looks like I, Madeline's got a comment. Yes, thank you. Let me pop my video back on and I'll take my hand down. I wanted to add on to that and I'll say thank you to him for, for referencing um, NRCS because we do have a uh, access to some pretty cool information. Um, it, you sometimes just have to take a little bit of digging to find it. Um, a couple of things I want to reference is that some of your NRCS field offices, even if they don't have it, they might have a way to find through our, our network of partners or other field offices, things like old web soil surveys, the hard paper copies, um, the paper copies of old range sites. Um, those are I've, the times that I've been lucky enough to find those. They've provided really great like historical information. And then a lot of NRCS range staff especially are involved with like the Society for Range Management, which um, can also be a place that we can kind of go look around to find more data. And I do want to talk about, because I'm a, a person, I'm not from California, and I'm in a position where I work in multiple counties. So something that's been really important to me uh, is local knowledge, uh, going to local like like chapters of the Cattlemen's Association or like sort of like clubs. I actually found through a duck hunting association here in Lancaster, they had these incredible maps and photos that were 50 years old that made this Antelope Valley area look completely different. And you know, this is just them. This is an old photo book that they kept in their clubhouse because uh, it had been for a while. So there's a few different ways that you can do some um, detective work to find some historical information that it's, it, and it's nice, you know, when you can work with somebody from Cooperative Extension or NRCS who can put the time and the resources into trying to dig those things up for you. Cause if not everybody has the time to do that kind of thing, especially when they're trying to run a working ranch in Southern California. Thank you, Madeline. Yeah, I'm, I'm really hearing here that the that collaboration is is kind of what allows these projects to move forward. So really appreciate both of you contributing there. Um, we also had a question for Matthew uh, that I'd like to bring up. Um, and it's kind of about the logistics of how a rancher or a rangeland agency uh, might apply uh, the, the uh, suggestion to develop a plan for strategic fire fuel reduction. 
Thanks, Joel. And what you failed to mention is that it is yet another good question provided by Dr. Larry Ford. And I, I like this question because it kind of puts my feet to the proverbial fire a little bit because I know that we can get up here and sort of make these broad recommendations. And often people are like, but come on, guy, you know, how do you actually put that into practice? And, you know, the question also nicely sort of pre- uh, you know, prefigured John's talk a little bit because, you know, I thought John did just an excellent job in summarizing exactly how in a, you know, rel in a realistic production context, he's great, you know, developing grazing management plans that address or at least have a component of, of fuel reduction or fuel management on an annual basis. You know, of course, the sort of other Weasley answer is it, it, it depends on the property. And there are so many individual factors on any, to any one property that, that allow or complicate how grazing management might be managed or how grazing might be managed for fire. And here I'm thinking of basic infrastructure, you know, so it, it matters a lot if you have a 12,000 acre ranch with no cross fencing, or if you have a 500 acre ranch with 16 paddocks. And obviously in the latter situation, you have a lot more control in where you're putting the cattle, where the impact is happening, and at what time of the year. Um, one thing that I'm impressed in John's operation and in um, other cattle operations that I see is the use of electric uh, fencing, electric, you know, polywire. And, you know, the technology is still evolving. Uh, it's still relatively new in, in you know, as in, in the ranching world, although I think proven. And I think it just adds a tremendous amount of flexibility to an operator's grazing management and to, and, and, and to say, I know a lot of the producers that I work with in the counties that I work are unfamiliar or unwilling to work with it. And I know sometimes it can fail and cattle can get out, especially when they're calves. But, um, you know, just thinking about adding flexibility and precision to grazing impacts, I think it's just, it's tremendous. I mean, similar things can be, uh, you know, similar effects can be achieved using turning water points on and off or placing salt blocks or protein blocks, et cetera, to concentrate cattle, you know, where you want the grazing to be the heaviest in the spring and early summer um, prior to fire season. But really, if you're looking for precision and, and high impact, you know, something like electric fencing um, allows for that. Um, you know, the cattle folks on this call aren't going to necessarily like this next statement, but I've seen, um, you know, there's a blossoming targeted grazing industry across the state, uh, targeted grazing specifically with small ruminants. Um, I know of a couple operators that work in San Diego County, and I mentioned them because even on a piece of property where you have cattle grazing, you might consider bringing on sheep and sheep and or goats. Uh, for specific targeted projects, maybe specifically for uh, fuel reduction. And so, um, you know, typically when you need the impact, the grazing impact from sheep and goats, you're probably going to need to pay for it, you know, which is different than a cattle, a traditional cattle operator who in most instances pays for uh, the ground that, that he or she operates on. Um, you know, but with that said, you you do achieve a pretty highly precise tool with these small ruminant operations that can come on and graze, um, that can graze, you know, in pretty tight spaces along roadways, around critical infrastructure and buildings, et cetera. I was in anticipation of answering this question. I did a little back of the envelope calculation. I, I recently saw a sheep, oper sheep and goat operation that was brought in to do a hundred foot grazing swath right beside some right behind some homes that abutted uh, an open space sort of rangeland property and so you know 100 feet it takes about 11 acres of grazing to do a mile of linear fence line at 100 feet wide and so you're looking you know targeted grazing rates can vary but anywhere from 300 to a thousand dollars an acre depending on the complexity of the project. So that gives you a sense of what, what these projects might begin to cost. Obviously, probably not cost effective per, for a private landowner, but certainly there's money pouring out of the state currently, especially through CAL FIRE, 
other government agencies to support, you know, uh, treatment, vegetation treatments that will prevent fire. So perhaps property owners and agencies and governments can begin to access money specifically to hire people to come on just for fuel grazing or, you know, fuel reduction grazing. Um, and the last comment I'll make is, you know, I think that there's sort of stepping back, there's three broad ways that one might think about um, how to graze for reducing fire risk. You know, the tradition, there's the traditional way of sort of putting a perimeter and maybe almost the way that John was talking about it, which is putting, in almost a perimeter around the whole property. And many of you probably drive on I-5 or I know Highway 46 outside of Paso Robles has good examples of this where you're driving and, you know, the, the farmer and rancher has just sort of disked, you know, uh, 20 to 50 foot wide swath right off the highway because there's just so many points of ignition along those highways. And presumably that rancher has disked around the entire perimeter with the idea being that you prevent fire from moving into the property at all. Another way you might think about grazing for fuel reduction is to graze really heavily around your critical infrastructure. Um, you know, John talked about sort of the difficulty of grazing all of your property all at once in the spring to reduce, you know, the threat of wildfire. Not only do you not have enough animals for that, but uh, you need you need some feed for the other parts of the year, right? So, um, you know, if you can, if you identify, you know, probably homes, you know, buildings, barns, um, propane tanks, water lines, et cetera, that are really critical and highly valuable to your ranching operation. Perhaps in many of many instances, those are internal and maybe central to the property itself and, and thinking about grazing really heavily around that in the spring and early summer. Um, and then the third way that you might think about it is, is recognizing that you can't sort of graze everywhere um, at the right time of year is, is, and John also talked about this, but is knowing and being familiar with your sort of fire weather patterns. And I talked a bit, a bit in my talk about this, but knowing the direction of prevailing winds, knowing, you know, when it's fire season, what direction those winds are typically coming from and beginning to graze, you know, on the sides of those proper, of the properties to prevent, you know, if you know that the gate fire is going to come from the southeast, you know, that's the part of the property that you always graze. So uh, rambled on here for a little bit. I'm happy to make this more of a discussion if anybody wants to sort of comment or ask for their questions to some of that response. Um, I would love to, to tag in and support you for a minute if, if Joel will allow me. Please, Marilyn. Yeah, put this back on. Um, I want to follow, like, uh, basically just tag along with what Matthew said. I am just, uh, especially from an NRCS perspective, I am such a fan of targeted grazing right now. For the last two years, I have been really sort of going down every avenue that I could to support the use of prescribed burning in Southern California and seeing a lot of the same obstacles come up over and over again. And uh, brush management, brush reduction is one of the most common things that, that NRCS works on in Southern California. And targeted grazing, the way that Matthew described it, not only can we, you know, bonus NRCS supports that um, financially, so that is something that we could write onto a conservation plan. It, it, it allows for a lot of things that other fuel reduction treatments don't, um, specifically like with prescribed fire. Still not, we still don't have a great route for, you know, liability cover for that. There's still, you know, politically and socially, people are still a little afraid of it. And I've heard a lot of horror stories about, you know, neighborhoods coming together and threatening to sue if they think someone's going to do a prescribed burn. And even if you manage to get through the government and administrative loopholes it takes to get one planned, if the weather is not exactly perfect the day that you want to do it, you know, you miss your window and you could not get to another chance for a long time. And when we talk about um, brush thinning using mechanical means, you know, that uh, it has its ups and downs as well. There's a lot of places that it's not practical or cost effective to use mechanical treatment. Um, it's uh, cost quite a bit. It, my experience from, you know, planning it uh, for NRCS is that, you know, it can be quite a bit above those numbers that Matthew was listing for his targeted grazing. And um, so I, I think that, uh, or yes, exactly. So I think the targeted grazing is, is one of the routes forward for immediate action, because one thing I hear a lot from producers is something needs to be done now. We know fire season is coming. We have to do something now. We can't just keep waiting for whatever entity it is that's standing on our way, right? But if we go the targeted grazing route, 
you know, we don't have to worry so much about permits. We don't have to worry about as much, you know, um, liability, especially if you were to work with your extension agents to find a great grazer with a really great, you know, control of their herd and movement, et cetera, and so forth. It just, it, it's a way forward that we can do almost immediately, in my opinion. And like I said, NRCS can cost share on that. And with very little, you know, regulatory limitations coming from state and counties. And um, I think it's a great solution. I do just want to backpedal just a tad and say, I didn't mean to suggest that cattle can't be used in a targeted grazing scenario. In fact, to the contrary, um, it's just most typical, you know, that sheep and goat operations are sort of reorienting their business structure to, you know, focus on this targeted grazing model. But absolutely, you know, cattle, you know, any, any grazer can be used for targeted grazing and, and cattle, especially. I know producers in the Bay Area who have acquired a lot of leases because they're willing to use electric fence and graze in places that have been historically ungrazed. So just want to make that point. Joel, can I make a comment? Please, yeah. So um, those were two really good good comments. I want to add something to this, which is that um, you know recently there have been some uh, large and potentially influential publications that come out. The USDI just released a, a comprehensive report on fire hazard and fire and fuels fuels management. And then the state of California has also produced uh, a similar, similar product. And in, the, the, in both of those publications, there's no mention of grazing or grasslands. This is, these are forest and shrubland dominated publications. And I think one of the big challenges in the South Coast is going to be integrating the uh, the balance between grasslands and shrublands and their need for the need for conservation goals, especially related to shrublands, and how then something like targeted grazing could be incorporated at the landscape level into these, into these systems where you are reducing the fuel hazards in woody vegetation as well as herbaceous vegetation. We've got really good ways to to deal with fuel reduction on the grasslands, but ways to change the balance between um, woody fuels and grassy fuels, it doesn't seem to have really brought, been come to the attention of the, the CDF or um, USDI um, publications. And so I think that's something that's gonna be need to be integrated into any kind of planning in the in the South Coast region. It's gonna require some work, but I think it's something that can be done, especially if you can adapt ecological site descriptions to this sort of a goal. Well, I, I wanted to add a little something too, um, uh, just about targeted grazing and the different types of uh, livestock that can be used for it. And I just wanted to share Rob Pollan's video uh, from from last fall when he showed how he's using Criollo cattle in East San Diego County to graze alongside Angus cattle, but up in more chaparral areas. So there's a lot of flexibility there for how, how we can be grazing um, and, and, and using different types of livestock to do that. Um, and, and that's actually important because as John's uh, shown me, in some cases goats um, might be too impactful to, to that some of those more sensitive environments. So um, having different livestock that can um, that can target specific plant species is really important. Um, we've got a couple converging questions here. One of them is from Dr. Ford and the other is from our, our board member um, Odette Gonzalez. And uh, they were wondering um, who is actually responsible for um, identifying those high risk parts of the property? Um, and, and how do they go about doing it um, so, that, uh, so that they can actually create a fire break or defensible space uh, with cattle as opposed to bringing a crew in? I assume that question's for me. If you'd like, go ahead, John. Oh, okay. Well, uh, Tracy Nelson basically had areas of uh, 
uh, that she knew were for, uh, which was the on-site manager for the CDFW. And uh, she had a good um, a grasp of what was going on um, in certain areas of the reserve. So, of course, you know, this whole premise on a reserve, I mean, we're grazing, we're not grazing, uh, you know, like a big commercial, you know, 10 or 12,000 acre situation. I've got a reserve uh, which is which is close to the heart of the CDFW and uh, regarding wildlife, uh, special species of uh, grasses, perennials, everything out there. So it's probably one of the uh, the you know it's probably a little bit of a challenge for you know depending on what you want to do to set up for a grazing plan. Each property is going to be different. Uh, you know, private property might not be concerned as much with certain aspects of a special species of of grass or, or plants or you know different types of wildlife but uh on conserved lands public lands uh anything like that those issues are going to be there so from that premise you need to come up with some kind of a plan on on minimizing the impact on those yet utilizing grazing to not just manage the property but also include the wildfire fuel uh, prescribed grazing uh, in in reducing wildfire fuel. So um, I'm going to tag on what Madeline said. Matt, thank you, Madeline, for correcting or clarifying because uh, we did a share of the cost program. It wasn't all a grant, and she was right on. It was seven years ago, and I forgot basically how you know it's been seven years seems like forever. But basically, a share of the cost program. I have you know I have expenses out of my pocket along with NRCS. So to ranch. You know, to do a conservation plan like that took tremendous amount of information, you know, that came up with, okay, what are we looking at? What do we have to, you know, what are our birds of special concern? What are things that we have to look at while we put this plan together? Um, they basically, along with our on-site manager, help us initiate this plan from the get-go. And I was just amazed at amount of information that they had available for us to put this thing together. I mean, I was just, it was, I was stunning. And still today, you know, to put these plans together, they have the ag engineers coming out to do a look at our, our water sites for our solar wells and stuff like that. Without those guys and their information that they have or their ability or their professional uh, engineering skills, you know, uh, these plans don't come together just off the cuff. I mean, they are a, a well thought out plan. And uh, the information that I got from NRCS was invaluable. And it didn't always necessarily just had to do with my conservation plan, but it had to do with, okay, what am I going to look at stocking rates if I have a 22 inch rain year compared to a nine inch rain year or a 10 inch rain year? They, they had a picture, I think, I'm not, I can't remember, but I think they had a picture of Axel Sanchez doing weights of, uh, of the range ground, uh, figuring out pounds per acre to, established a starting AUM. So basically, and they did that on our site as well uh, when we first started seven years ago. So all that stuff is valuable information to get, you know, just to get started. And then as you, as you progress on that particular property, depending on how much time you have, which, you know, if you're, if you're a conscientious grazer, you're minimizing the impact to wildlife, special species, all this other stuff is on there, but you're you're actually grazing and you're bringing an economic value to that property. There is no doubt you are bringing an economic value to that property when you do some form of prescribed grazing based on a plan that you set up with either NRCS or the on-site manager or uh, whatever conservancy you're working with <laughs> or public lands uh, company that you're working with. So I'm not sure if I've answered the question other than basically there is no... There's no set pounds per acre on my property uh, based on, on per paddock. I have either, at this point, I have either grass height, stubble height, which can also equate to uh, pounds per acre. Uh, but I have a lot of, uh, um, basically, I've seen over the years how my particular property responds based on the number of inches of rain I've had per year and during the time of year I've had it. Our newest, uh, our newest thing that we're watching right now over the last couple of years has been the space of time or the length of time between rains during our growing season, 
which has been, you know, 45 to 60 days, which is a new factor that I haven't had before. <clears throat> so it has affected the range uh, ground growth um, and gone from there. So uh, basically every year seems to be different so far, but it's, it's uh, you have to be, you know, you have to pay attention to what's, what's going on out there on the range um, while, you're, while you're grazing. Thank you, John. Um, Matthew, I see your hand up, but Tracy Nelson uh, is the reserve manager. We haven't heard from you yet. So did, did you have something to share about I, this conversation? I do. I want to I want to go back to the original question of how were these areas or sites identified for grazing? Um, and that when we originally started, that's a really simple answer. Uh, I had a thousand acres out of the almost 6,000 acres on this property, a thousand of it was, uh, you know, fallow historical agricultural production lands. Um, so what I had were monocultures of non-native annual grasses and weeds. And what we know as wildlife biologists is that that habitat type presents the least valuable type for wildlife in these, in the types of habitats that we have here. And so it was kind of a no brainer to go after that thousand acres and try, rather than try to restore it ecologically to what we think it used to be, because we don't, those resources don't exist, uh, was to bring it back to functional. And what the, the one value the habitat does have is forage habitat for uh, for birds, uh, particularly raptors, but uh, also other uh, passerines. And they don't benefit from a monoculture of tall, dry thatch. They benefit from a habitat that evolves with the season. And the only way to do that is to is, you know, then produce edge effects and produce change is either burn it mow it or graze it. And grazing really pre presents, especially with cattle, presents the most economical uh, um, and, and, you know, uh, applicable method because, you know, we don't have the staff to go out there and mow and mow and mow. And like Madeline said in, in many more words, stars have to line up to be able to burn a property. You know, or a portion of a property. So, so I have done that actually before we did grazing, we did some burning, but that's become very, very difficult. Uh, so I hope that answers the question. With regard to areas we did not pick for grazing, it's because we have a really good idea where our wildlife resources, the uh, rare sensitive resources are. And in that sense, you know, all I did was really target those non-native annual grasslands and avoid the areas where uh, application of grazing would take a lot more scrutiny. And so as the years have evolved, we've kind of expanded grazing in areas that we think we can, that will benefit from grazing while we still have sections of the reserve that we don't apply grazing because the amount of scrutiny and research that would have to go into getting something like that approved you know, say there's a federal species that nests in the area or, or is there all year round. We, we're still avoiding those areas and, you know, considering in the future, there may be some, some way to graze that too, but, you know, more information is needed. So I hope that helps. That does. Thanks, Tracy. And it shows us how uh, land managers with with different goals in mind can actually uh, find you know a common method to address them. Um, I'm afraid that we're starting to run out of time here, um, but we do have uh, we are able to follow up with some of these questions afterwards. Uh, I know that the San Diego Habitat Conservancy was interested in learning more about um, how calves pass through the fence, and that's something we can follow up um, individually with you on. And I see a comment from Jeremy Walker here. Um, about uh, collaboration with the Cattlemen's Association on Criollo cattle. Um, and again, we'll probably follow up with you on that. I'll link you in uh, with, um, with Rob Pollan and John afterwards. Um, Matthew, do you have a brief comment to add? I saw that your hand had been up. 
Thank you, Joel. I was going to just follow up on the question I asked earlier on the chat, but if there's other questions, I'm happy to defer. Yeah, um, well, we, we just have a few minutes left, but um, uh, Jeremy, it, did, it looks like uh, your question here, maybe you could, uh, could ask John if you'd like to have it answered now. John, do you see this question here? Has there been any work done with the CCA to voice the value of Criollo cattle compared to Angus? Um, uh, in the Southern California landscape, which has a lot of brush and some grasslands. Uh, they typically bring less money in at the market, um, which may discourage producers including this type of cattle in their herd. I think, um, I don't know if there has been something done with the Cattlemen's uh, Association, but I do know Rob Pollan at, uh, at uh, Corte Madera uh, has a USDA grant through the University of New Mexico. If you guys ever had a have a chance to look at that, uh, uh, Joel, do we have that video up on the RCD website that they can look at or YouTube or something we can refer yeah, to? Yeah, the, the same page where these videos are, we've got that creative cattle up there too. Okay, good, yeah. Well, I think one of the things on there is, is um, I don't know if the, the CCA has done anything in regards to it, you know, so there's mixed feelings about it. Some people feel that we're, you know, sending the cattlemen's, you know, industry back 500 years by introducing the Coriolos again. But the reality is, you know, we need we need something for these, you know, high chaparral woodland areas to try to manage and, and deal with some of the, the heavier, thicker fire fuel load, not just our grasses. Uh, and especially here in San Diego County, and I'm sure it's just, it could be the same up in Santa Barbara <clears throat> and other areas as well. I, I'm not as familiar with it, but uh, just other than driving by. But um, Rob had, uh, he actually collared, they had put GPS collars on the, uh, on the Angus cattle and GPS collars on the Coyoyo. And there are methods of, you know, you can train Angus, you can train their animals so you can train them. There are ways of training your, you know, Angus cattle to go to the top of a mountain and graze and then come down, uh, graze down low, uh, uh, lower elevations later or the flat later, uh, or you can, uh, you know, basically use these Coyoyo cattle that they don't prefer grasslands. They prefer high density shrub, uh, thick, you know, uh, thick high chaparral areas, and that's where they graze. Well, the GPS collars significantly, you know, uh, it, it showed you where they were grazing naturally without any training, without any, you know, movement of the cattle. Um, it, it's really interesting. Yeah, you get, you don't get uh, the same price per pound on these cattle uh, at all. Uh, there's the possibility you can run a higher number uh, of head because they're not the same size. Their average weight's 850 to 900 pounds. Uh, so you're not going to get the same price per pound. You possibly can make up the difference by running a higher number. Um, but I don't know all those numbers yet. The economic factor of doing that as a cattleman uh, is, is still kind of, it's still kind of out there. It's not, it hasn't been resolved. Um, so those are all things that are, you know, they're still kind of pending with the, that grant that uh, Rob has through the USDA. <clears throat> I do know it, it was certainly interesting seeing them. I ac actually helped them move the cattle. Uh, they don't move like my Angus herd whatsoever. <laughs> you know, they're not a, they don't say to groups, they got horns, they, you know, and they kind of go off on their own. They, you know, they, they you have to really, uh, you treat them differently. They act differently. But uh, on the other hand, you know, you're not having mm -hmm. to force them up into that area to graze. And they are definitely managing that area. And on Corte Madera, they've got, you know, I think they graze 10,000 acres of which only 2,000 or 2,500 acres is uh, grassland. So, you know, utilizing that, that makes sense for Corte Madera to really kind of look into this study. And um, it, it was a joy to work with Rob and talk with him about that more. So I'm kind of anxious to hear more about the results. So I don't know if I helped you answer the question, but that's, you know, we should, you know, I think uh, his information is on his video um, if you ever need to get hold of him as well. John, this is Rob. May I add something? Oh, hey, Rob. <laughs> yes, may yeah. I add something? Sure. Part of the study, uh, we, we, so, we sold 40 head of, of calves to New Mexico State 
as and part of the USDA study, and these were half Criollo, half Angus calves, and they are now in a feedlot up near the Texas Panhandle being studied to see how they compare uh, weight-wise, meat-wise, both quality and weight uh, with the straight Angus or English, you know, or continental breeds of cattle. And that's part of what this study is all about. And then again, this, this fall, we'll be sending more, the second group of, of calves up to them to study. And they're just now getting the uh, information back. And once I get something, uh, um, you know, solid, I, I will forward it to you. Uh, thank you so much, Rob. That's a, that's a big deal for us here in San Diego County. And uh, you know, possibly Matt want to, might want to look at it too. The, the other thing that has been really surprising to me is uh, one of the, the ownership of the ranch wanted to try to bring back some of our native bunch grasses, the needle grasses, the deer grasses, which are all perennial grasses rather than annuals. And uh, the, the, the last six or seven years that we've been running the Criollo cattle, we're seeing a, 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 a pretty good increase in the native grasses coming back. And as anybody knows how hard it is to bring native grasses back, especially the bunch grasses, it's a booger. But, uh, and without a lot of, of you know, special work, it's just, it's just the way they hit the grasses and the way they move seems to be. But like you said, we've had, you know, this year was kind of an average rain year and then we had two wet years before that. So uh, I would say that uh, I, I really am happy with, with, with what I'm seeing with our pastures as far as the native grass is coming back. Well, Rob, really glad to have you on the call and thanks for sharing your experience. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's neat to see you pioneering this. And I feel like a lot of these questions that were asked today generally kind of express the state of things, which is that we're seeing a window open up for prescribed grazing to really apply to a lot more different uh, uses because of the benefits it provides. I mean, just on the ranch itself, it improves the productivity over time. From a carbon perspective and a climate perspective, it's sequestering more carbon in the soil. And so it's therefore uh, a, a solution for some of our climate change issues. It addresses habitat and biodiversity concerns uh, expands defensible space and reduces fire risk. So um, it's just a very holistic approach dealing with these issues. Um, and so I wanted to share with you before we close today some of the some of the ways that um, this work is being funded. Um, in case some of you are interested in incorporating prescribed grazing into what you're doing, um, and also some of the different ways that uh, policies are changing to encourage it more at the state level. So I'll just take a couple minutes here. Um, but uh, there's a, a few uh, funding opportunities that I'm working with currently uh, to try to share with the uh, producers. One is offered by the USDA, uh, the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. It's economic relief if you um, were not able to uh, keep as many cattle or, or if you suffered losses to your herd or were not able to fully distribute what you produced, um, the CFAP2 grant um, can pay you per head for that. Um, uh, also, it, now that uh, the entire Western United States is, uh, uh, according to uh, federal policy now under extreme drought conditions, um, there is drought assistance available from NRCS through the EQIP program. And I'm sure that's something that Maddie could explain more to you about if you're interested. And then the main program that I work with is the Healthy Soils Program offered through um, the California Department of Food and Agriculture. That's the program that funded this work, but this is a demonstration grant. There's also incentives grants. So if you don't aren't planning on doing an outreach component and you just want to get on the ground and get your cattle moving um, with prescribed grazing techniques, um, there actually will be two rounds of funding this year for this. So one is expected mid to late summer of this year. And then again, there will be a round of funding about six months later. So we're waiting to hear from CDFA on those exact dates. But if you're interested in applying to a CDFA grant, I will be holding workshops later in the year 
and uh, would be glad to speak with you individually. Um, there's also some encouraging policy updates um, around prescribed grazing. Um, the, the state budget surplus recently um, resulted in a lot of groups collaborating to request um, investment in the resiliency of our state's agriculture. And some of those requests included focusing on actual processing facilities and training for those processing facilities locally. So uh, the, the request was made for $70 million. Um, and that's because we kind of, as John's been explaining to me, we really have a bottleneck here where even if you're able to produce, um, to support a herd um, on the land that's available, we uh, it's still difficult to find local slaughter uh, houses or processing facilities. Um, so even if you wanna sell it locally, you still have to um, move them around the state hundreds of miles away in order to complete the process. So it's really a bottleneck. Um, and then in addition, uh, the, the AB 125 or the state budget request also included $10 million for infrastructure for prescribed grazing because as was described, fencing and um, the, the access to, to water is really critical to uh, making this effective. Um, our resource conservation district that, that I work for also just um, was approved for a planning grant for sustainable agricultural land conservation. Um, and so over the next two years, we're going to be um, researching, talking to people and writing up a plan about um, how best we can make sure that these, uh, these precious lands that are beneficial for habitat and, um, and for agriculture don't actually get converted into um, development. So um, if you have opinions about the conservation of your land or, or about conservation easements, um, you can expect to hear from me in the next few months. And I'd, I'd really welcome you to reach out to me because I'd love to learn more about the issues that are facing your ranch. Um, that said, there's a few other services that we offer at the Resource Conservation District for ranches and for farms because our, our uh, program does work with uh, orchards and vegetable crops as well. Um, we offer sampling, soil sampling for organic matter. So just like on, on John's uh, on, at Rancho Hamul, where we've been monitoring um, soil organic carbon for the last few years to see how it's been sequestering um, from these prescribed grazing practices, we can conduct those, those tests elsewhere in the county as well and on your ranch. Um, we're doing this planning effort. We also offer um, hedgerow design. If you'd like to um, install native plants um, to improve the habitat or um, to uh, uh, bring in more pollinators or reduce uh, wind issues, uh, we can help select the plants that would be least ma lowest maintenance, lowest water use, and the highest benefit to, to uh, the ecosystem. Um, and then as I referred to earlier on, as you can see in this picture, um, our most robust program is our no-cost shipping and defensible space program. And so Homeowners in fire safe councils throughout the county take advantage of this um, to have their uh, brush chipped once they've cleared it and, um, and elderly or low income residents are able to actually have the space, the defensible space cleared free of charge. And so all of these types of opportunities um, and events um, are regularly discussed in our monthly newsletter. Um, it's uh, just starting up again, but we have a farmer and rancher newsletter where I uh, talk about uh, these topics, upcoming events, funding opportunities, even jobs in these fields. So if you're interested, please visit our webpage, the Carbon Farming page, and sign up for our newsletter. Um, and with that, I really want to thank all of our presenters. Um, it was really clear how much um, effort you put into it, and I, I really loved how all the topics complemented each other so well. Um, I hope it was informative, and, and John, I really appreciate you sharing your, your hands-on experience um, with, um, with these practices. Um, the recording of this presentation will be available afterwards. Um, I'm going to post it to the YouTube page. I'll share it by email to all of you. Um, and again, I'd encourage you to sign up for our newsletter if you'd like to receive more news about uh, these types of activities. Um, and, uh, and lastly, if you have any questions or if your questions weren't answered today, please reach out and I'll make sure to uh, communicate with the presenters to make sure that, um, that you get that addressed. So again, thank you so much to everyone for, for joining today. Um, it's a pleasure meeting with you.